Hatchet, Chapter 6, Part 2 There must be berry bushes. He stood and moved out into the sand and looked up at the sun. It was still high. He didn't know what time it must be. At home, it would be one or two if the sun were that high. At home, one or two, his mother... At home, at one or two, his mother would be putting away the lunch dishes and getting ready for her exercise class. No, that would have been yesterday. Today, she would be going to see him. Today was Thursday, and she always went to see him on Thursdays. Wednesday was the exercise class, and Thursdays, she went to see him. Hot little jets of hate worked into his thoughts, pushed once, moved back. If his mother hadn't begun to see him and forced the divorce, Brian wouldn't be here now. He shook his head, had to stop that kind of thinking. The sun was still high, and that meant that he had some time before darkness to find berries. He didn't want to be away from his. He almost thought of it as home, shelter, when it came to the dark. When it came to be dark, he didn't want to be anywhere in the woods when it came to be dark, and he didn't want to get lost, which was a real problem. All he knew in the world was the lake in front of him, and the hill at his back and the ridge. If he lost sight of them there was a really good chance that he would get turned around and not find his way back. So he had to look for berry bushes, but keep the lake or the rock ridge in sight at all times. He looked up the lake shore to the north. For a good distance, perhaps 200 yards, it was fairly clear. There were tall pines, the kind with no limbs until very close to the top, with a gentle breeze sighing in them. There were tall pines, the kind with no limbs until very close to the top, with a gentle breeze sighing in them, but not too much low brush. Two hundred yards up, there seemed to be a belt of thick, lower brush starting, about ten or twelve feet high, and that formed a wall he could not see through. It seemed to go on around the lake, thick and lushy, lushly green, but he could not be sure. If there were berries, they would be in the brush, he felt, and as long as he stayed close to the lake so he could keep the water on his right and know it was there, he wouldn't get lost. When he was done or found berries, he thought, he would just turn around so the water was on his left and walk back until he came to the ridge in his shelter. Simple. Keep it simple. I am Brian Robeson. I have been in a plane crash. I am going to find some food. I am going to find some berries. He walked slowly, still a bit pained in his joints and weak from hunger, up along the side of the lake. The trees were full of birds singing ahead of him in the sun. Some he knew, some he didn't. He saw a robin and some kind of sparrows and a flock of reddish orange birds with thick beaks. Twenty or thirty of them were sitting in one of the pines. They made much noise and flew away ahead of him when he walked into the tree. He watched them fly, their color a, blight, a bright slash in solid green. And in this way he found the berries. The birds landed in some taller willow type of undergrowth with the wide leaves and started jumping and making noise. At first, he was too far away to see what they were doing, but their color drew him and he moved toward them, keeping the lake in sight on his right. And when he got closer, he saw they were eating berries. He could not believe it was that easy. It was as if the birds had taken him right to the berries. The slender branches went up about 20 feet and were heavy, drooping with clusters of bright red berries. They were half as big as grapes, but hung in bunches much like grapes. And when Brian saw them glistening red in the sunlight, he almost yelled. His pace quickened, and he was in them in moments, scattering the birds, grabbing branches, stripping them to fill his mouth with berries. He almost spit them out. It wasn't that they were bitter so much as they lacked any sweetness, had a tart flavor that left his mouth feeling dry. And they were like cherries and that they had large pits, which made them hard to chew. But there was such a hunger on him, such an emptiness, that he could not stop and kept stripping branches and eating berries by the handful, grabbing and jamming them into his mouth and swallowing them pits and all. He could not stop, and when at last his stomach was full, he was still hungry. Two days without food must have shrunk in his stomach, but the drive of hunger was still there. Thinking of the birds and how they would come back into the berries when he left, he made a carrying pouch of his torn windbreaker and kept picking. Finally, when he judged he had close to four pounds in the jacket, he stopped and went back to his camp by the ridge. Now, he thought, now I have some food and I can do something about fixing this place up. He glanced at the sun and saw he had some time before dark. 
If only I had matches, he thought, looking ruefully at the beach and lakeside. There was driftwood everywhere, not to mention dead and dry wood all over the, all over the hill and dead dry branches hanging from every tree, all firewood and no matches. How did they used to do it, he thought. Rub two sticks together? He tucked the berries in the pouch back in under the overhang in the cool shade and found a couple of sticks. After ten minutes of rubbing, he felt the sticks, and they were almost cool to the touch. Not that, he thought. They didn't do fire that way. He threw the sticks down in disgust, so no, spot, <clears throat> so no fire. But he could still fix the shelter and make it, hear the word, safer, came into his mind, and he didn't know why, more livable. Kind of close, kind of close, close it in, he thought. I'll close it in a bit. He started dragging sticks up from the lake and pulling long dead branches down from the hill, never getting out of sight of the water and the ridge. With these, he interlaced and wove a wall across the opening of the front of the rock. It took over two hours. And he had to stop several times because he still felt a bit weak and once because he felt a strange new twinge in his stomach, a tightening rolling. Too many berries, he thought. I ate too many of them. But it was gone soon and he kept working until the entire front of the overhang was covered save for a small opening at the right end nearest the lake. The doorway was about three feet and when he went in he found himself in a room almost 15 feet long and eight to ten feet deep with the rock wall sloping down at the rear. Good, he said, nodding good. Outside the sun was going down, finally, and in the initial coolness the mosquitoes came out again and clouded in on him. They were thick, terrible, if not quite as bad as in the morning, and he kept brushing them off his arms until he couldn't stand it and then dumped the, chair, the berries and put the torn windbreaker on. At least the sleeves covered his arms. Wrapped in the jacket with darkness coming down fast now, he crawled back in under the rock and huddled and tried to sleep. He was deeply tired and still aching some, but sleep was slow coming and did not finally settle in until the evening cool turned to night cool and the mosquitoes slowed. Then at last, with his stomach turning on the berries, Brian went to sleep.